So I spend my time with the people trying to invent the future, with entrepreneurs in many locations who see massive growth ahead. If they bet on how automation, how artificial intelligence, how data connectivity are going to change opportunities. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, I think, what will be one of the dominant political issues of the next 10 to 20 years, which is what happens to those many, many millions of jobs that the machine will do more cheaply and more efficiently. But um, before we panic, this is not an issue that's come out of the blue. You know, a couple of hundred years ago, reports of this character who a couple of decades earlier had smashed some looms, Ned Ludd, became central to a movement of protest about what these new industrial machines were doing. Back in the 1920s, this was a review of a book in the New York Times. The fear of the new machinery, the book Social Decay and Regeneration. A decade later, John Maynard Keynes talked about technological unemployment. It became one of the justifications for government economic intervention. Again, back in the 1960s, the debate continued. Massive packages in Time magazine warning Americans there was change. And even you know, in our own era, big magazine features like The Atlantic talk about robots. And we're still here, and most economies are thriving. But there's a coalescence of a few very big trends happening. There's Moore's Law accelerating things. And I get a sense that the world is never going to move this slowly again. And that is going to have a fundamental impact on the need for human beings in all sorts of workplaces. Um, so we've got used to examples like this. This is the company that Google is now trying to offload. It's a company they bought called Boston Dynamics, was making robots for the military. But Google is now kind of beyond interested in this. This is kind of a known, although I think at Boston Dynamics they spend most of their time teasing their humanoid robots. Um, it's going to get more interesting because of things like this. This is a man uh, is in a self-driving car for the first time. I'm not touching it at all, and it's driving. Whoa, whoa, lanes are getting a little... Oh, no, there it goes. This is a Tesla that automatically downloaded the software overnight to become autonomous. And this is one of those metaphors for something bigger. Travis Kalanick at Uber is talking about replacing a million Uber drivers with the autonomous vehicle as soon as possible. And, you know, everywhere we look, the robot is going to have an impact. Um, this is one I'm looking forward to. It's the laundry robot. This is a product called Foldy Mate on the market now. Um, what about the cooking robot? We did uh, a report in Wired about this. It follows the movements of chef's arms and puts ingredients together so you can kid your dinner party guests that you have made that beautiful meal yourself. Um, and when we talk about robots, kind of there's different interpretations about what it means. Um, in retail, it means delivering products to people where they are, when they want it. This is a London company called Starship Technologies that's developing these little robots to take goods the last mile, which is the really expensive part of that process. And they're testing them on the streets. I don't know if they've tested them on the streets of Peckham in South London, but I think that may cause trouble. So, you know, this is not the future. This is now it's being tested. And if you mix what the robotic technologies are doing, the price coming down, to some of the things that this gentleman is doing in a lab just behind St. Pancras Station, um, this is Demis Hasabis behind a company called DeepMind. Um, when I first met Demis about three years ago, this is a company with lots of AI PhDs. He was very excited that although they had no products on the market, they had no revenue, they had finally sold space invaders. 
So they programmed the machine to try and get the highest points, but didn't tell it how to play Space Invaders. So they just used the pixels as the data input. Demis said the first half hour, it kept getting killed. An hour later, it starts to recognize the patterns. They left it on all night. By the morning, it was the world's best ever Space Invader player. So this company with no revenue was then bought by Google for quite a lot of money. And then, as you probably recall from the news, um, it took on a tougher game it's called Go, which was much harder no, than chess. No, it's and just in April, this is the European champion it beat, and then they beat the world champion. AlphaGo won 5 0, which is the first time ever um, a program has beaten a professional player. And that was way before even the AI experts said that was going to be possible. And it kind of caused a reevaluation. There were papers in Nature, there was big scientific debate, and there was a realization spreading through the world of AI that pretty soon. It was going to be hitting, this is general artificial intelligence that Demis is building, which is a longer term game. Um, but the very specific narrow AI is really starting to have economic value. Um, I'll just give you a couple of examples. This is a company, Orbital Insight, that uses satellite data plus algorithms that analyze it to optimize judgment of how busy individual retail chains are by counting the number of cars or pedestrians going in and comparing them with rivals, comparing them with that day last year. Their customers are hedge funds, investors, who can bet for or against those stocks. Sentient, the best funded AI company in the world, at the moment is doing a number of things. It's got its own fund that's betting on the markets more effectively, they say, than humans. It's working with health companies. It's in hospitals tracking patients as they've come out of surgery. 30 or 40 data points they track. They say they can spot signs of sepsis, blood poisoning, very quickly. If you catch it within half an hour, you can save lives. Um, this is a company called Berg in Boston that is using AI to reverse engineer the discovery of new drugs. It's designing them through the AI, and then, only then, when they look promising, starting to go into tests. And just to give you an idea of how quickly this is moving, um, computer vision, the ability of the machine to recognize what's happening. This is a piece of open source software called NeuralTalk. This is a gentleman walking through the streets of Amsterdam with the machine recognizing what it's seeing through his laptop webcam. So if you see the words at the top, it's moving probably more quickly than I can explain. And this is now. And this is free open source software. So just think what is happening inside the big tech companies. So you're hearing a lot about machine learning, about deep learning, long-term, short-term memory. There's a whole new vocabulary we're going to have to learn. There's a project in New Zealand at the university there, how the machine can learn how to, like a baby, think like a human. Sure. Picture. Okay, baby, what's this? What's this? Good. See so if she can read the it's words. It's got sensors okay. Okay. perceiving Mommy. Mommy. What, does this say? what it sees and what it hears. Come on, over here. Look at me. Focus. Baby, over here. What's this? Good. So we won't need babies in the future. Um, around the corner from here, actually, there's a lot of post production happening in London. They're using amazing AI to save advertisers a lot of money. Introducing the Blackbird a revolution in car advertising. The biggest challenges facing automotive advertising are car availability and subsequent model revisions. Until now, you've needed the car to make the ad, and model revisions become costly and complex. The Blackbird solves these issues. For the first time ever, you can shoot and repurpose a car ad without needing the actual car. Having mastered photoreal CGI vehicles, we pioneered the technique of reskinning using stand-in cars. Realizing that the most important aspects of the stand-in car are its physical driving performance and its wheels, we've designed and built the world's first fully adjustable car rig. At the push of a button, the Blackbird can adjust its length by 4 feet and width by 10 inches. It can change wheels and alter suspension to mimic virtually any chassis design. Its electric motor is programmable to emulate the driving characteristics of almost any vehicle, past, present, or future. So never believe the advert again. So there are companies now that have face recognition 
that can tell your emotions from a distance. This is a company called Sitecore, scanning in real time a crowd, telling you not just the demographics, but how angry this person is, how sad this person is. This is a company that Apple bought recently. What if your devices could read your emotions and respond to them? Emotion is developing technology to do just that. Our industry-leading emotion-aware system will enable a revolution in device and application personalization. We're taking more pictures and videos than ever before. Imagine organizing this content by emotion so your most memorable moments are easier to find. Kind of cuts out the need for humans in many use cases. Um, my favorite example though, of face recognition so far is this American company that sells its services to churches so they can know who pretended to be in the congregation on Sunday but wasn't actually there. <laughs> so AI is becoming everyday mainstream. We're going to talk to it increasingly. It's going to be the bots, the tiny bits of computer software that are the customer service conversations we have. This is H&M on an app called Kick using a bot. And this exponential curve is going to make these services better, cheaper, on one of those doubling and doubling basis. So Moore's law means stuff that was expensive becomes free before you know it. It changes perception. What happens if it's 1994? when storage is $1,000 a gig, and I say to you, we'll create a company where we give away storage, call it Dropbox, we'll be billionaires. Makes no sense then, but pretty soon, wow, that's an opportunity. And this is hitting not just software, it's hitting the falling cost of sequencing human DNA. So I'm going to give you a few terms that are going to affect the number of people employed by what we today consider the job. You're going to hear a lot more about the machine which gets better at improving itself, than the person. We're going to hear a lot more about decisions being taken by the algorithm that has none of the biases and prejudices of the people in this room. We're going to hear about new ways of simulating what would happen if you shut the Hammersmith Bridge, what would traffic in West London do within seven minutes. And it's going to mean, in a lot of cases, the human will not be helpful. We may not need these. If you're making you know, credit reference decisions, this is a London startup on Fido that's taking lots of data and helping algorithmically decide whether this is a, this is a good bet. Um, it's happening in healthcare at the same time. This is a company called Emulate that's making organs on a chip to make it much more efficient to test medicines early on. We can now edit DNA using tools such as CRISPR that are gaining ground. And there's even a kind of democratization of this happening, a DIY biology movement, a 3D bioprinter that builds 3D living tissue out of human cells, or this one. Their URL, by the way, is weare3dbioprintinghumans.org. Just don't worry about it or anything. So if you add the ability of the machine to think in an effective way. The ability of the robot to work in a cheaper and cheaper way. You start to get things that we're already seeing at the edges. 3D printing. This is an example from China of a bunch of houses 3D printed in 24 hours. It's probably not the quality of build that Second Home has appreciated, but it is the start of something. We're at the start of a whole new kind of architecture post-human architecture, Rem Coolhouse calls it, to feed the needs of this automated economy. This is the gigafactory that Elon Musk is building um, in the Nevada desert. But, ever the optimist, I think the human, if the human is allowed to preserve some of its humanity, um, will still have a role. So the machine is still not great, as Rohan said, at being creative thinking in an artistic way. This is a Google project to use the AI to create art based on vision. It's fun, but we haven't yet come up with the superb novel writing, the superb filmmaking AI. Um, there are companies now, this is one called Narrative Science that is doing my job, that is replacing the human in algorithmic kind of sports or city news services. But I think there's still going to be a demand for the person who understands the humanity of the people to whom a story is being told. And, and finally, the people who 
who are going to build the successful companies of the future, I think are going to use both the machine and the essential humanity that we all, as partners, as customers, need. Um, because they're going to build these businesses in a way that are designed to keep involving, in a way that doesn't rely on a core workplace but distributes the production, the feedback loops, the storytelling. There will be businesses built around the sort of platforms now that we're starting to see. In real estate, there's a whole bunch of landlords building sizable businesses on platforms like Airbnb. And the machine is great at a lot of things, but this serendipitous creation of ideas is something that we humans in the right environment are still pretty good at. The business of tomorrow won't have certainty, and it will move as quickly as consumer market demand changes. And increasingly, I think, that business will, build, will be built around a purpose that goes beyond simply making a profit. And we did a cover story in Wired three months ago about purpose-driven businesses that were also, because of their strong mission, making really good revenues. Because you can attract talent. Because it gets you through the highs and lows of the economic cycles. So there are posters in organizations like Facebook, which I think reflect how the workplace, the business of tomorrow, is going to have to think to get over this. I'm actually an optimist because I see a lot of the problems that we're confronting today will be solved more effectively than the AI. My son twisted his ankle yesterday. We spent a few hours in A&E, and I was thinking the clunky human processes of queuing and waiting for the X-ray the machine is so much more efficient. Algorithmic personal health care is a solution. So I'm going to leave you with a question. So if you pull your screens out, and if we can see the question. So I'm intrigued by what we do for the next generation, and how we best prepare them for this uncertainty. So I'd like to ask you how you will best prepare your children for the economy that's emerging. Um, is it about teaching them to code? Is it about teaching them to find their passion? Or is it, more generally, teaching them to be adaptable? So coding's gone out of fashion. Passion is semi-fashion, but adaptability is the key, um, which I kind of agree on. Although I think there's a bit of passion. If you find something you're absolutely in love with, you'll find a way to make a living. Thank you. And Marianne, mm -hmm. I'm all yours. <laughs>